And I'm excited about this message today. I believe the Lord gave me a, a word just for you. And we're going to cover some scriptures. And some of these might not might even be new to you, may not have ever even read some of the scriptures we got, we're going to read today. And But when you read them, uh, it's going to it's going to explode in your spirit. It's going to bring revelation and illumination, and it's going to bring strength and help. Your faith is going to be energized. And so let's, let's pray together as we uh, prepare to hear what God has to say to us today. Father, we thank you for your words. Your word is a light to our path. It's a lamp to our feet. Your word is living and sharper than a two-edged sword. Your word is powerful, and your spirit is here to teach us and lead us into all truth, to quicken us and to give us understanding. Yes, we ask you, Lord, for the spirit of wisdom and understanding in your will. We ask you, Lord, that, that we would increase in our personal experiential knowledge of you, in our fellowship with you, and in the doing of your will and the doing of your word, oh, because your apostles said that we'll be blessed as we do your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And so this, uh, we've been in a series we started last week in such a fearful world, we need a fearless church. And so this week, we're gonna talk about something we have from uh, one of Paul the Apostle's letters to Timothy. And so the title of this message is Fight the Good Fight of Faith. How many of you know there's a good fight? And this is the good fight of faith. Uh, one reason it's a good fight, it's because when we fight in faith, God is fighting with us. And with God's power hooked up, connected with you, taking hold together with you and fighting with you, and when the blood of Jesus is applied to your life, hallelujah, when you are speaking the sword of the Spirit, when you have the shield of faith quenching every fiery dart of the wicked one, this good fight of faith is a fight that you win. Praise Jesus. So fight the good fight of faith in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. And so before we read that, let me just say to you that sometimes, you know, to, to many people, faith is merely a, a word or a theory or wishing, just trying to be positive. But faith is much more than just being an optimist. Faith is trusting in God, taking him at his word, and receiving his promises. See, God is the God of grace. He has made promises, and he has shed his blood for our salvation. And that salvation is, is uh, more than just where your eternal destiny is, but his salvation makes you whole. It secures you. It heals you. It, it, it provides for every need. It's your complete redemption, your spirit, soul, and body. And so faith is something that we receive God's grace by. And so you can make faith a reality and an active power in your life. You can experience God's promises in your life through faith. So we're going to dig in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Get out your knife Get out your steak knife. We're going we're gonna to get in here. We're going to eat some good spiritual food. Jesus said we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So here it is from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. He says, you, O man of God, flee these things. There are some things he talked about, uh, the love of money and some other things. He says, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Now, this, this patience here is an endurance. It's a steadfastness. Verse 12, he, and we put a verse on the Victory uh, Fellowship Facebook page uh, from James chapter 1, verse 12. It says, blessed is the man who is steadfast. Blessed is the person who's steadfast. And so we are to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, in endurance, gentleness. And then he says this in verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. That's not just longevity of life, but it's also quality of life. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold, appropriate, take hold of the God kind of life on eternal life, 
to which you were also called. In other words, God has chosen you. He wants you to have this life. He wants you to fight the good fight of faith, and he wants you to win. Of course, Hebrews says that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who are cheering you on. And there's many saints today, the church is cheering you on. So you've been called to win. You've been called to receive life. And look at this, and he says, and of course, you were called, but then we are to respond as the Holy Spirit draws us and and helps us. It says, and have confessed the good confession. So that's a real big key in fighting the good fight of faith is your confession. Having confessed the good confession, what's a good confession? Well, it's agreeing and saying the same thing that God has said in the presence of many witnesses. How many witnesses? Many witnesses. Really, all the witnesses who hear what you say need to hear your good confession of faith. Every time somebody hears us, they're a witness to what your profession is. Verse 13, he says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. And before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession, it means he testified, he made a good confession before Pontius Pilate when he was tested. See, there's some things we need to know about the fight of faith. There's a test to your faith. And uh, sometimes people don't understand this. Sometimes they've thought, well, you know, if I have faith, if I'm a Christian, well, God will just automatically make my life wonderful. Uh, Nothing bad will ever happen if I have faith. Well, that's, that's just not biblical. That's not scriptural. And so we need to know that in the life of faith, in our journey of faith, there's going to be a fight to your faith. You're going to have to fight for your faith. And there's a testing of your faith. Of course, James says rejoice because the the testing of your faith is, is going to purify. Amen? And you're going to build stamina and build endurance. And so Jesus Christ witnessed, he testified a good confession before Pontius Pilate when it was a challenging time to do so. And so the apostle says this, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, and he will appear soon, which he will manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Can I hear amen in the house of God today? Who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Aren't you glad he never runs out of power? Let's look over another scripture in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. The apostle says this, and we can take this to our our heart and, and personalize this for ourselves also. He says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. See, when we're in Christ Jesus, there's a grace that's available to you, and, but of course, we receive that grace by faith. How many know that you can have grace? Also, Peter says that God's grace can be multiplied to you through the exceeding precious promises that God has spoken to you and is speaking to you. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses... Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure hardship. What did he say? He said, you must endure hardship. Now, he didn't say hardship's going to take you down, but he did say hardship is going to be part of your experience. But he said, you can endure hardship. And so sometimes that when hardship happens, sometimes people go, wow, I thought I was a Christian. I thought God would automatically just make my life easy or take care of every threat. No, you're going to endure hardship, but through faith, you shall endure it and you shall overcome it. Amen. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. How many knew that you were in a battle? How many knew that you had an enemy? And so you are a soldier of Jesus Christ, and the battle we're called to fight is the fight of faith. And he says this, this is is great. Verse 4 says, No one engaged in warfare 
entangles himself with the affairs of this life. There's some things we just haven't got time to get entangled with. <laughs> We're on a mission. We've got weapons. We need to get charged up by the Spirit of God. We need to get full of the Word of God. We got people to minister to. We got people to witness a good confession to. We've got uh, people to give to and help. So w we have a mission. We're on a calling. We have a direction from God. And so when you, when you have a direction and a plan from God, there's some things, you know, you can't just do everything. Verse 5, he says, And also if anyone competes in athletics... He's not crowned unless he complete, competes according to the rules. And so, uh, and so that, in other words, he's saying there's training involved in that. Uh, as we are going to fight the good fight of faith, we, we prepare ourselves, we train ourselves, uh, so that when the test is happening, when the hardship is happening, when life squeezes you, what's going to come out of you? Right? Faith. The words of God. Amen? And, and, and uh, you're clothed in the armor of God. In uh, 1 Corinthians 10, I'm going to read to you uh, a story in the Old Testament that just really embodies what we're talking about this morning. But before we do that, I want to show you this verse in 1 Corinthians 10 that just shows you how applicable this story from the Old Testament to you is. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, that's the Red Sea, which was a, a, a symbol, a picture of baptism, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, right? So there's physical drink, there's physical food, but there's also spiritual food and spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. Hmm, that, that, that should prompt a great question in your mind. Wait a minute, how do I please God? Well, Hebrews 11 says it's impossible to please God without faith. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and we need to believe something about who he is. We must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Well, that's great news, because if you diligently seek him, guess what? You're going to be rewarded. In other words, you're going to find him. Amen? So uh, you, uh, we're telling you how... God can be pleased with you as you fight the good fight of faith. And so uh, in verse 6, he says, Now these things that we read in the Old Testament became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted and do not become idolaters as were some of them. How many know there's some temptations of idols in your life today? Things that you put in the place of God, things that, that you uh, worship or tempted to, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. And then he says this, this is very enlightening, he says in verse 11, now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, so that those things that happened in the Old Testament were written for you. They were written for you to learn from. They were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Guess what? You qualify. And so there's some great lessons we can learn from the stories in the Old Testament. They were written for you to read and for you to be admonished by them, to be encouraged by them, and comforted by them. So let's go. Uh, we're going to look in Joshua chapter 1. Uh, the Israelites have been rescued from Egypt. They come to the promised land. Of course, now at this point with Joshua, they've been wandering for 40 years. But here they're coming to the promised land where, remember, the spies had seen the giants and the walled cities. And, of course, now they've had 40 years to prepare. But they, by now they probably forgot the Israelites are out there. 40 years, you can forget some things. But here they come. And so verse 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass. So even, man, if you're a servant of the Lord, even though Moses died, he's rewarded. Uh, he, he has eternity with the people of God, with God, amen. 
And so there's a reward for the servants of the Lord when they die, amen? And they have a confidence. They die in hope, in resurrection. But it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan. How many know there's some obstacles, there's some rivers that you got to cross? Go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm giving to them. So here is a promised land, and this is a symbol for you and I. There are promised blessings across Jordan that God has for you. To the land which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel, and look at what he says in verse 3. This is huge. Verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. Look at that. No, notice it didn't say, well, everything is automatically yours. No. It said, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, in other words, every place you put your foot, that's a promised blessing that you have now received. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I, God, have given you. As I said to Moses, be strong and of good courage. So here is the mission. Go into this land of blessing, promises that I've promised you. Every place you put your foot, it's going to belong to you. But you're going to have to actually walk there. You're going to have to put your feet on it. And he says to him, so there's going to, but there's enemies. There's enemies in the way. And so he says, be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong. You could could have a choice, a temptation to be weak. But he says, only be strong. And very courageous. Very courageous. See, here's the thing. You might not feel like, well, I don't think I'm a very courageous person. But when you're strong in God's grace... When you're filled with his faith and you're clothed in his armor and you've got his promises, then you can be, you can be very courageous. In fact, faith is, is, it's got a courage to it that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. By the way, I was listening to Dave Ramsey this week. He said for every one case of coronavirus, for every one person who's who's affected or infected, and of course there's many thousands who who recover, hallelujah, but he said for every one case of of someone uh, that's positive with coronavirus, there's a hundred people out of work. There's a hundred people who have lost income. And so there is a health situation that we're challenged with, but there's also a financial situation that many people are challenged with. And so look at this, though, as we, as we uh, put our feet on God's promises, on that land, uh, stepping on it by faith, fighting the good fight of faith. Look at this. It says, as we are uh, uh, observing God's word, meditating on his word, putting his word in our mouths, putting his word in our hearts, then uh, if we don't go to the right hand or to the left, you may prosper. May I? Yes, you may. You may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Ah, oh, but that, see, that's where a big fight is because sometimes your mouth can be tempted to say a lot of things like the old hee-haw show. Oh, woe is me. Deep, dark depression and right? So your mouth can say a lot of stuff that isn't what God is saying about your situation. So you need to find out what God is saying about your situation and say the same thing. Then you're testifying. You're making the good confession before many witnesses. The demons will hear it. The angels will hear it. And God will hear it. And when God hears you making that good confession of what he has said about your life and about your situation and your body, then he's like, amen, so be it. Hallelujah. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. 
Sometimes you get in a situation and a challenge you weren't expecting. But if it's in you, it might be day, it might be night, it might be the middle of the night. But let that word come out of you, amen? Because you put it, David said, I hide your word in my heart. Thank you, Lord. Why do we do it? Because there's going to be a challenge, there's going to be a time you need it. But you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. How many of you know there's some good promises there written? And so as you receive that promise in faith, you find it in the Scripture, and then you receive it when you believe it, amen, and agree with it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Who wants good success? Just make a comment on there. I want good success on your, on your Facebook uh, feed. Amen? And uh, the good fight of faith, good success in fighting the good fight of faith means you win. Verse 9, he says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. How, do you, how many of you knew that? God has commanded us, do not be afraid. Oh, we, could, we can pass up lots of opportunities to be afraid. But he says, don't be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Hey, man, hey, God's with me wherever I go. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, so Joshua heard this from God, and then Joshua starts giving orders to the people. He goes, he says to the officers, pass through the camp and command the people, saying, prepare, get ready, gear up, people, saddle up. Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. God's giving it, but they also yet must possess it. And so I want to say to you that faith is a possessor. Faith is a possessor. Every place where your foot shall step, I have given it to you, God said, for an inheritance. And so this is the inspiring promise that greeted the Israelites as they faced the promised land, as they, as they faced the, the obstacles to get into the promised land, as they faced the enemies and the walls, uh, God said, every place where your foot shall step, it's yours. I've given it to you. And so those footprints meant, what did those footprints meant? Possession. That was the land title deed. When they put their footprint, hey, that's my land. <laughs> Hallelujah. Footprints mean possession, but it had to be their own footprints. They couldn't just sit on the other side of the Jordan and let Joshua go over there and walk everywhere and then come back and say, okay, I found a place for you. No, they had to bring their own feet. Bring your own feet with you. <laughs> and so in possessing your New Testament blessings, God's promises to you that he has provided for you through his redemption, he thought of everything that you would need, and it's been provided for you in Christ through his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection. Amen? Every promise that you put, you put your feet upon, in other words, that you, that you make yours, that you receive by faith, is yours. Let's look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God, oh, we're about to get happy in here today. We're about to get excited this morning for all the promises. How, oh, that's a lot of promises, all of them. All the promises of God in Christ are maybe, oh, I don't know, hope so. No, they're yes, and in him, amen. For all the promises of God, you ought to underline this in your Bible. You ought to open up your Bible and look at this yourself and see these words with your own eyes, Right? Uh, definitely you got to put your own eyes on some of these promises and then get these promises in your own mouth. That's like putting your foot and treading on that piece of land. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen. You know what that means? It's certain. So be it. Amen means it's a certainty, so be it. To the glory of God through us. Well, that's an interesting statement, isn't it? You know what that means, though? I mean, it's not just something you just, we should just gloss over and go, yeah, to the glory of God through us. Glory to God. 
Yes, it's glory to God, but he is glorified through you entering into that promised blessing as you receive, remember, because it's not just automatic, but as you enter into that promised blessing, it's yes and amen. One of the things is that you're saying yes to it and you're saying amen to it and you're in agreement with God and God says amen to it. And so as you enter into and receive that promise from God, God is glorified through you. Oh, that's fun. I love it. And so all the promises in the Bible are yours. So do not be slack. Of course, there's some qualifications sometimes, and so look at those qualifications and make sure you're doing what it asked of you to qualify. So do not be slack to go up and possess your land. This is not a time to be slack, right? It's a time to go up and take our land. Between you and your possessions are powerful enemies, right? And as we face coronavirus, that's an invisible enemy. And sometimes people are like, man, if it's an invisible enemy, it's hard to fight it. But guess what? You have some invisible weapons, and you have the force, the power of faith that is more powerful, and it's invisible. It's more powerful than any virus. Amen. And so uh, those enemies gather, but as you gather your forces of prayer and faith in that all-sufficient name of Jesus, and you go against them, don't stop until every last enemy is conquered, vanquished. Amen? Let's look at another verse here in Romans chapter 8, verse 16. See, we've also got the Holy Spirit to guide us, to help us, to take, to take hold together with us. Amen? Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself, that's the Holy Spirit, bears witness... In other words, he testifies. To bear witness means he's, he's testifying. And who does he testify to? He testifies with your spirit that you are a child of God. How do you know if you're a child of God? The Holy Spirit tells you you are. Not an audible voice, but from spirit to your spirit, he bears witness to your spirit. And guess what? Then he says this. If you're a child of God, if children of God, then what does that make you? Heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Woo! If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. How many know that Jesus fought a good fight of faith on the earth in his ministry? And in, in uh, redemption, in, in his sacrifice, he fought a good fight. And that he fought a fight that he won, and he won that as our champion, not just for himself, but for you. Amen? Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, yes, there are some sufferings in this present time. But guess what? He says, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Hallelujah. In Hebrews, let's look at another passage, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence. Now, see, there's, there's diligence involved in fighting the good fight of faith. Sometimes people don't know that. Uh, but when you're believing God, when you're trusting God, when you're in faith, when you're praying, there's some diligence in our part. We got to cooperate with God. There's some diligence, even in finding God's promises. There's some diligence in uh, putting his word in our mouth. Amen. Amen. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance. See, here's the thing. When you diligently seek God, right, in faith, when you do that diligence, guess what it's going to produce? A full assurance of hope. In other words, it's going to produce a confidence in you. The same kind of confidence that Joshua, that Caleb, when he's older, he says, I'm going to take my mountain. I want my mountain, right? There's enemies there. Oh, I can take it. I'm going to get it. He says uh, that you, and a full assurance of hope until the end, until you finish, until you win. What, what, what's a full assurance of hope until the end? Until your victory, until you win. He says, 
that you do not become sluggish, but in a lot of things that the enemy does is to try and discourage you, to cause you to be sluggish, to cause you to not go in and put your feet on the promises of God's prom- blessings. Amen? But imitate those who through faith and patience, man, faith and patience work together. Amen? That's one of the, 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 the things that we need to learn as we grow and mature as believers that, you know, sometimes we expect, well, if it's faith, it's going to be like, uh, I dream of genie, poof, and it's, it's immediate. <laughs> but it's, it's, an, it's instantaneous. But that's not how it works. And so we know that faith and patience work together. And through patience, uh, we, uh, we win. Amen? And we receive. And so he says, imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, right? When you go to court, they put the Bible, you put your hand on there, and you swear by God, God, so help me, God. Well, who was God going to say, so help me? Who could he swear by? Right? He had to swear by himself. So God the Father to God the Son make an oath to each other where neither one of them can break it. For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. That's cool. Saying, surely or certainly, blessing, I will bless you. That's how much God is committed. He's given an unbreakable promise to bless you. Surely blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. Get ready to be multiplied. (laughs) Hallelujah. So after he had patiently endured, how many know there was a fight that of faith that Abraham had to fight to receive this blessing that God just said? See, God said it's certain, but there's a fight involved on your part. After he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. He patiently endured in faith to continue believing even when it didn't look like it was working. Come on. That's where that fight to faith is you're in the trenches. Verse 16 says, For men indeed swear by the greater, And an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to who? To the heirs of promise. You've got an inheritance that's promised to you. To the heirs of promise, the immutability, the unchangeableness of his counsel confirmed his promise by an oath that by two immutable things, two unchangeable things, God is is swearing an oath, God the Father and and God the Son, Jesus Christ, are swearing an oath to each other. Neither one of them can fail. Neither one of them has ever lied. We might have, see, and then he says this, which it is impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation. Guess what? That's how you can be strong and very courageous because you have a strong consolation. You have strong support from God himself who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope. Hope is something in the future, but you can lay hold of that in the now. Something set before you, God's promises set before you. Guess what? You can lay hold of them now and they become certain for you as you exercise your faith in them right now. Verse 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Woo! Everybody say, I'm anchored. I'm anchored sure and steadfast. Guess what? So I'm not going to be moved. I'm not going to be swayed and which enters the presence behind the veil. That's in the holy throne room of God. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Let's look at uh, another scripture that kind of illustrates this issue of faith 
and patience working together because that's part of the fight that sometimes if we don't understand, if we don't endure in faith, then uh, that's how we could lose the fight to faith. So look at this, Mark chapter 4, verse 26, and Jesus is speaking, and Jesus says that the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. What a wonderful creation seeds are. Uh, Christine and I were just working in the garden. Uh, we, we got some seeds. We're planting these wonderful things that grow up and produce these delicious things that we can eat. They're blessings. But when you plant the seed, that's a promise of a blessing. You plant that seed in the dirt, you water it, and you cultivate it, and you endure in its growing season, and it will produce uh, a good fruit for you. So he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night. See, when you endure in faith, you've planted the, you, you've laid hold of that promise. You haven't maybe experienced it yet, but you know it's coming. And so you can go to bed, go to sleep and say, God never slumbers or sleeps and he gives his beloved rest. He gives his beloved sleep. Because I can go to bed at, and you know you can go to sleep in faith. Come on. When you've laid hold of a promise of God, when you have confessed that you've asked God, I believe your promise to me, I receive it, right? Then you can go to sleep in faith, even though you haven't seen that answer yet. You're still in the fight of faith. You, you haven't seen the victory yet, but you can lay down and go to sleep, just like Jesus was sleeping in the boat during the storm, right? He went to sleep in faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. So there's a process. We need to understand there's a process. The seed should sprout and grow. He himself doesn't know how. You may not know how God is going to work things out. You don't know how you're going to win. You don't know how you're going to be restored to health. You don't know how your bills are going to get paid. You don't know how you're going to get rid of that uh, awful habit that, that is a problem you don't know how it's going to work out, but as you lay hold of God's promises and you fight and endure in faith, uh, it's going to, as you sow that seed, uh, it's going to produce fruit and you're going to harvest it. You don't know how that seed produced it, but you're confident that it is. Look at this. He says, for the earth yields crops by itself, Right? That means you don't have to make it happen every step of the way. You set yourself an agreement. You, you, you uh, put your foot on it. You lay claim to it, but the promise of God by faith, you don't have to make it happen. You just have to cooperate with God, and he'll make it happen. So the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens right? There's a time when something's ripe. When the time comes, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So part of the fight of faith is enduring in faith until harvest time, until harvest time, until what you were hoping for, now you're handling and experiencing, and it's, it's now become the past, and now you're on to the future. And so the size of your inheritance that you're experiencing in this life right now, how much land, uh, depend, you know, it depends on how much land you've stood on, right? If, if Joshua said to you, go into this land and wherever you put your feet, it's yours. Well, so how much you have depends on how much walking you've been doing. <laughs> it depends on how much of the promise of God you've put your feet on, amen? Amen. How much land you've stood on, walked on, and really fought the fight of faith for? If you've not possessed it all, well, don't get discouraged. If you haven't possessed it all, guess what? That means uh, there's more for you to possess. Uh, uh, there's, and the more of it is, is yours, the more is yours possibly as you dare to possess. Let's look at another scripture, and this will help you. It just goes along with what we're saying about fighting the fight of faith. And uh, so Ephesians chapter 6, we need to read this. You may not have read this, but uh, if you haven't, and this is the first time, I think it's going to really uh, turn on some light bulbs. 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And that's what we want to do around here. We're turning on light bulbs. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Don't be strong in yourself. Be strong in him, in his strength. Receive his strength. Be renewed in his strength. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, you're going to uh, overcome, you're going you're gonna to win over every strategy that the devil might throw at you. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Guess what? How many principalities have you seen? These are spiritual entities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's not God's heaven. That's in the atmosphere uh, around us. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand, in other words, that you may be able to win in the evil day. Don't be surprised or shocked that you look around and, man, this is an evil day. Well, God said it would be an evil day, but guess what? He's given you his armor. He told you that to, to fight. He said, he said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but he didn't say you're not wrestling. You're wrestling, but against invisible things. And that's the harder fight, actually, right? And so, but God has given you the weapons to fight invisible things. Hallelujah. So you can take up and appropriate for yourself God's very own armor to protect you so that you can withstand the evil day. And having done all to stand. Well, that means you're the last man standing. In the battle, in the fight of faith, that means you're the last woman standing. You're the last man standing. Hallelujah. You're the last family Thank you, Jesus. In other words, your enemy is vanquished and you're still standing. That threat against you, it's gone, but you're still there. And so we put on the whole armor of God, which will protect you, make you invulnerable, and the sword of the Spirit, which makes you invincible. That's your offense. The armor is defending you. That sword, man, you're going on offense and you're taking new ground. And so you fight the good fight of faith. And what's a good fight? A fight you win. Endure hardness, as he said, right, as a good soldier. And so guess what? You can do it. You can endure hardness. God's grace will support you and strengthen you and replenish you and refresh you. Hallelujah. As a good soldier. Everybody say, I'm a good soldier. I'm a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I got armor. I got weapons. I got, uh, I got uh, fellow, fellow soldiers in my squad. He's, uh, and resist the devil. What did the Bible say? Resist the devil, and he will run from you as if in terror. He'll flee from you in terror. Man, when you, when you stand your ground and say, all right, I'm going to beat you, and, and then he's like, ah, and he's out of there. And you will find the promise that God has given you, you'll find it true. And you'll taste it. And you'll experience it. And you'll wear it. Hallelujah. And it'll make you look good, better than you were without God. Amen. Amen. And the devil will flee from you. Let's look at this in Luke chapter 10. Uh, I just want to share this with you. You may not know this, what Jesus has given you. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. This is revolutionary. This changed the world for the followers of God. Luke 10, verse 19. Behold, Jesus from his mouth. Jesus said, behold, look at this. I want you to notice this. I want you to think about this. I'm so excited to tell you this information this is going to change your life. I give you the authority to trample, to step on serpents and scorpions and over all 
Everybody say all. The power of the enemy. Guess what? Coronavirus is in the power of the enemy, right? I give you authority to step on, to put under your feet and crush it, right? Over all the power of the enemy, serpents and scorpions and viruses and bacteria, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice, guess what? Because your names are written in heaven. That means, of course, all of us are going to die at some point, but that's not the end for you and me. When we die, we die in faith. Because our names are written in heaven, we have an eternal uh, purpose, an eternal plan of God, and, and his plan is good, by the way. You know, we don't often think this way, but most of your life is in the future. Your life in the new heaven and the new earth doing God's will, fellowshipping with each other, uh, doing things and having adventures, uh, enjoying your mansion, right? It, that's going to be a lot longer than this life now. This is, the Bible says, like a breath. But we're going to be a, for eternity living out God's purpose and plan for your life when this life's over. Forever. I don't know if you thought about that. That's a long time. <laughs> and so this is cool. He gave us authority in this life to step on our enemies. And, and that's important to know because as we showed you, the Israelites, there were enemies blocking them from the promised land. But they, they marched in and they tread on their enemies. Right? When Joshua came to Jericho, the walls came down and the Israelites ran up over there. They stepped on Jericho and they made it theirs. So there might be an enemy threatening you. There might be an enemy saying, oh, you're, you're going to die. But you say, no, nope, here's, here's my size 12 coming on your head. Because you're standing on my promise. And I'm moving into my promise and so you're getting out of the way because that promise is from me. It's got my name on it, and I'm going to put my foot on it, and that means you're going to get out of the way. You're going to be under my foot. You're going to be overdone. 1 John chapter 5, let me leave you with this. Verse 4 says, For whatever is born of God... And we said earlier, the Holy Spirit bears witness to your spirit that you are a child of God. And this is what John says, whoever is born of God, and how do you get born of God? Whosoever believes, whosoever calls upon the name of Jesus, Jesus, be my, I want you to be my Lord. I recognize who you are, that you are God. You died for me and rose again to give me eternal life. I ask you to be my Lord. I receive eternal life. I receive salvation. Jesus, be the Lord of my life and you're born again, you're spiritually, your spirit is recreated in Christ. And so John says this, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. What's in the world? Man, anything going on in this world, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So I wanted to bring this to you today. And so you need to know that there is a battle involved with faith. There's a fight to fight for, our, for us. But guess what? This is what Jesus has promised us. Whatever's born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome. Notice he's saying it in the past tense, right? And that means it's certain. But we have to fight the good fight of faith and use our faith. And remember, a good fight is the fight that you win.